When you code something, your output ends up being a bunch of bits, a digital artifact. If you have any interest in programming, I advise you to send those artifacts as far and as wide as possible, because you never know who they're going to resonate with. Good morning. Say I was surprised was a huge understatement. Nocturnal Nightmares was a game I coded 30 years ago, when I was 13 years old, with my childhood friend Martin. If you're wondering why someone was contacting me in the middle of the night via Twitter, so was I. After we finished a few levels of our game, we released it as shareware. That means we uploaded it to a local BBS, and people could download it and try it out. If they liked it, or maybe if they didn't, they'd upload it to other BBSs, and so on and so forth. This is how games tended to spread before you had the internet. The idea was that people could distribute the game for free, and some people who downloaded it would like it, and if they did, they'd send you a few bucks in the mail, and then you'd mail them a full version of the game. Some things didn't even include a full version of the game, it was just a registration, like a document that said, I own this full version of the game. In the 90s, not everyone with a personal computer had a modem, and even those who did didn't know how to call a BBS necessarily or even want to, but a lot of people wanted to play games. Some entrepreneurs noticed this and released shareware collections on floppy disk or CD-ROM. You could get them at your local computer store, I even saw them in convenience stores at times, but often they were just traded by people back and forth. That tweet I got in the middle of the night? It was a Twitch streamer who had been playing through one of these shareware CD-ROM games and found Nocturnal Nightmares. They told me they had fun with it, which is their way of saying they found it hilariously bad. I don't blame them. They wanted to know if they could get the full version. Unfortunately, we never finished the full version. I think we knew even as kids that this thing wasn't that great. We received virtually no correspondence about it, and I think we just kind of moved on with our lives and forgot about it. Thing is, I haven't been able to stop thinking about Nocturnal Nightmares since I got that tweet five years ago. Was the game really that bad? Is there anything we could have done to improve it? Could I do better? <laughs> Nocturnal Nightmares has a fairly simple story. You're a young boy named Jimmy who has been abducted by aliens. You manage to escape by grabbing a laser pistol, and then have to shoot your way to safety. The core gameplay involves running down long and repetitive corridors, shooting aliens as they pop out. You can run by holding the right mouse button, and the left mouse button shoots a laser beam. You can't turn. I was inspired to make this game after I downloaded a leaked alpha release of Doom, and was blown away by its graphics. The only programming language I knew at the time was QuickBasic, an enhanced version of the basic programming language for DOS, with better graphics capabilities. Now, I'm going to be honest, there's a lot I've forgotten about QuickBasic and DOS in the last 30 years. I feel the need to dive deeper into this program, and remind myself how it works. Unfortunately, I no longer have the source code. Martin was much better at archiving than I was, but we'd lost touch. The email address and phone numbers I have for him no longer work, and the last I heard he moved out of the country. I have a link to his inactive Twitter account, so I sent him a DM, but I wasn't optimistic about receiving a reply. I was going to have to reverse engineer my own game. Finding a copy of Nocturnal Nightmares was easy enough. The Internet Archive has one for download which runs fine in DOSBox. All of the data has this NN1 extension, which is obviously made up. However, it is curious that so many of the files are 64,007 bytes long exactly. The game ran in VGA at 320 by 200 which is exactly 64,000 bytes, so that seems suspiciously close. Opening them in a hex editor revealed a lot of repetition. These were definitely some kind of uncompressed images. Googling quick basic formats led me to this article about bsave. Jackpot. It's a 7-byte header followed by the raw data. I was easily able to extract the image data, but the colors were wrong. The VGA mode that Nocturnal Nightmares uses is delightfully simple to work with. Video memory starts at address A000 hex and is 64k in size. 
drawing a pixel is as simple as setting one byte of RAM. The 256 colors are a palette, and they can be changed to have an 18-bit color value. The reason the colors are wrong on my export is that the palette information was not included. Fortunately, I found out that DOSBox has a way to dump the current VGA palette. I applied it to the images, and voila, we're in business. I was able to extract all the graphics for the game, and even found some unused graphics, like this hideous red level and this alternative user interface that looks inspired by Dr. Mario. The next file I tackled was laser.nn1, which was not the same file size, and probably a sound. Sure enough, a hex editor shows a header of create a voice file. I'd forgotten completely about this format from the early Sound Blaster sound cards. Surely it couldn't be as simple as renaming it to .voc, could it? Success! The file format might be antiquated, but Audacity plays it fine. Martin came through. He had all the source code as well as all the tools to compile it. I'm incredibly thankful for his hard work, although I have to admit I was a little apprehensive about opening my code for the first time in 30 years. Fortunately, it wasn't that bad. The code was easy to read and follow. Something caught my eye when I was looking at the extracted assets. This is probably a coincidence due to my lack of artistic ability, but the hallway is a perfectly smooth gradient. There's a trick in the VGA mode to animate such things. I even knew this trick at the time. You can see it here in the intro when the alien ship turns off its cloaking device. It's called palette cycling. I mentioned earlier that to draw a pixel on the screen you have to write a byte to video memory. However, once that byte is there, you can change its color by writing a few bytes to a palette register. When you change a color this way, all pixels on the screen with the same index change at once. The master of this technique is Mark Ferrari, formerly of LucasArts. His website has some incredible examples of this technique. To be clear, in all these examples the image is staying the same, it's just the colors that are changing. I wondered if I could apply this technique to my hallway, and if that would allow me to use more of the screen. Getting a DOS development environment up and running was fairly simple. I found a copy of Borland C on the Internet Archive that worked, and accepted most of the syntax I was familiar with. I was able to edit code in Vim on my local computer, and then tab over to compile and run in the DOS box. I did have to sprinkle in a few methods of assembly language to set up the video modes, but fortunately early 8086 assembly is super simple. Before long I had this hallway up and running. The movement is very smooth, even on a slow computer. I wasn't very happy with the perspective though, so I modified the hallway drawing code to add more segments the closer you get to the edge. I was quite happy with how fluid it looked, but it was still lacking texture. A few years ago I was taking an improv class and the teacher taught me a really good lesson. He said, you can always take it further. The idea here is that if you're playing a tired person, you don't just have to close your eyes. You can nod your head, or take it further still, slump over a chair, start making weird sleepy noises, fall on the ground. When you're there, you think you might have taken it as far as possible, but no, you can still take it further. You can snore loudly, you can roll over. Is that as far as you can take it? Probably not. You can wake up for a second. You can be like, where am I? Then sleep again. You can do something, you can always make it better. That's the point. The same year I released Nocturnal Nightmares, a small group of Finnish people released their seminal PC demo, Unreal no affiliation with the game engine. In it, they debuted an effect known as the wormhole, which rendered textures in a way that seemed impossible on computers at the time. They did this using palette cycling. Instead of the one-dimensional version I'd implemented, they used a 2D grid of colors and cycled them. The trade-off here is you need to reserve many more colors up front, but the effect speaks for itself. I adjusted my hallway drawing code again to render a 14x14 14 14 pattern in perspective. This uses 196 colors, leaving 60 for the game to use for other things. It's very blocky, due to the low resolution of the texture, but this is much more impressive looking than my 2-frame cycling, and would have run fine, even in Quick Basic. 
I was happy with what I'd achieved here, but the low resolution textures were bumming me out a bit, and I felt like there wasn't much more I could do with palette cycling. If I wanted to display higher resolution textures, I was going to have to draw the pixels every frame, and if I was going to move that many pixels around, I'd have to do all the drawing in assembly language. I took advantage of the fact that the player can't turn, and the screen is perfectly symmetrical. In C, I pre-calculated a table of the line's starting and stopping points, and started on an assembly language function to render them. I learned the Borland C debugger is excellent for stepping through assembly language and examining the registers in memory at any given point. It took some work, but I managed to create a proof of concept that rendered a wireframe of all the pixel positions. I drew up a higher resolution wall texture, and converted it into a format my program could read. A couple of hours later, I had it rendering in real time. Now this is what my 13-year-old self had in mind. I purposely used very few colors on the textures, so that I could apply some basic lighting. I stored increasingly dark versions of the colors in the palette, and then updated my drawing code to switch between them as it got closer to the middle of the screen. I was pretty happy with these results, but you can always take it further, right? Lately I've been learning a lot of modern game development techniques, and I started to wonder, could I remaster my own game? I loaded up Blender and got to work. I started on a floor panel for the corridor. I'm using Substance Painter here to texture it. I generally try to stick to open source software, but I've not yet found anything that compares to it. I stuck with the blue color scheme of the original, but added a lot more detail. The next thing I built was a window. Transparent surfaces would have been computationally ridiculous in DOS, but modern GPUs handle them just fine. I booted up the Godot game engine, which is free and open source. It might not have all the advanced features of Unity or Unreal, but it's no slouch either, and I find it very fun and fast to use. It didn't take long to get something up and running. I found a free texture for stars on Reddit, so I imported it and tweaked the ambient lighting. I realized I wanted some lights to appear inside the hallway as well, so I modeled some quickly in Blender, and imported those too. The assets were starting to get repetitive, so I designed an arch, and another panel. Next up, I needed to focus on Jimmy's gun. The original was only a few pixels high, so I didn't have much to work with. A chrome cylinder with some red paint looked fun. After I imported the model into Godot, I added some minor scripting to have the gun follow your mouse cursor. I also set it up so that when you held the right mouse button, it moved you forward. I went back into Blender to model a simple laser beam, and then I added code to have it shoot out of the gun when the left mouse button is clicked. This was surprisingly one of the tougher aspects of the project for me, as I'm not great at 3D math. It was time for some extra details. I added a light source at the end of the gun, and set up an animation so that it would quickly grow in intensity when the gun was fired, like a muzzle flash. Once I got that working, I added some spark particles that would fly off the beam after it made impact, which looked very cool. I added some code to make the screen shake when the beam makes contact with the ship walls. This is one of those effects that adds a lot of feeling to a game, and I highly recommend it. It was time to add the aliens. The original design was quite basic, and I stuck with that. I modeled an alien in Blender, rigged it, and added a few simple animations. I really enjoy working with Godot's animation system. I set up a state machine for the alien's actions, such as emerging, getting hurt, attacking, and dying. I created a custom shader for the new actions. Then, I was able to easily animate the shader via the exported variables. Next, I made it so that the aliens would emerge when you got close. I did this by adding a collision area to the alien, and fired an event when the player entered it. The aliens needed a hole to emerge from, so I set out to model that too. This took a bunch of tweaking, and I'm still not 100% happy with it, but it'll have to do. As a final touch, I've added some sound effects to bring the whole thing together. At this point, I really feel like I'd flexed and achieved something. It's not going to win any awards, but I had a lot of fun doing it, and that's what really counts, right? All the source code that is for DOS, C, Assembler, and even the Godot source code and assets are on GitHub, so feel free to download that and play around with it as much as you want.
Now, some of you might be thinking I could take this even further. And that's true, this game would go on indefinitely if I let it do that. But the point isn't to do that. The point is to push yourself a little further than you would have gone before, and maybe achieve something really cool. I feel like I certainly did that here. If you're a programmer or a creative type of any kind, I suggest you try the same thing. Take it further. Now time for the typical YouTube spiel. If you like this video, like and subscribe. Drop a comment, tell me what you liked about it. Tell me what you'd like to see in the future. I'm not sure which way I'm going to take this channel just yet, so I'd love to hear some feedback. Have a great day. Always on my mind.